The following program was provided by an independent producer solely responsible for its content. The opinions expressed do not necessarily represent the views of this station, its staff, board of directors, or underwriters. There is one Earth. We all breathe the same air. We must eat. We must drink. When a child is born, we are very happy, and when there is a death, we're sad. But this is Gidge World because everybody has a world that they live in. Now, the guest we have this evening happens to be my son, Sky. And this is his third time being here. He left us about four years ago to go to China to teach English. Since then, he has done lots of things. So we're going to get to it, but we're going to sort of recap what he's been doing for four years. Sky? Yeah. You're back. I am. Yeah, so you haven't been back. This is th three times that you have been on this show, but three times that you've been back. And it's been, what, going close to five years? Yeah, almost five. That's the last time you came home, you were with, uh, were you with your No, girlfriend? no, no. That was this last time I was home was just a few months ago. I'm home now because I need to change my visa. Ah, which we will we'll, we'll explain. Now, you obviously born in Nashua. You mm -hmm. went to the high school. Yes. UNH. Yeah. And your your journalism major major yeah. journalism major. And you had how many jobs I interned, working in a paper? Interned at a newspaper uh, when their stock crashed, and somebody hung a Grim Reaper over the newsroom door, which was kind of a sign of where the industry was in 2008. So I decided to chase my dreams and move to Boston, 2008, looking for writing jobs and found absolutely none. Instead, I worked office jobs, terrible office jobs, spent uh, about eight months working in the basement of a mental institution. Uh, quite depressing job, actually. Um, and I got really tired of living like that. And on the weekend, I was teaching English is, I guess, kind of a hobby and kind of a se second income. To a uh, Chinese girl. Oh, yeah. One was a Chinese student. Yeah. And they said, why don't you just go teach English in China if you'd rather be teaching English? So I looked for a job online, and I found it, and I moved to China. How hard was it getting a job? Uh, very easy. It was very easy for me to get a job at that time. That's five years ago. Is it, is it easy for uh, English people, let's say from, well, obviously English, I mean, teach English in China? Yeah. It, well, it depends where you want to live. The less developed areas, they kind of have lower standards as for who can be an English teacher, and the more developed areas have higher standards. Um, so you must be in a higher standard. Well, when I started out, I was, I mean, I don't know how much experience I really had. I had tutored, and then I earned a, a teaching thing online, and then they gave me uh, one, two hours of training and then had me teach an eight-hour day. Really? Yeah, in northern China. The quality standards aren't what we would expect in America for teaching. Is it is it being from America and uh, uh, being a you know young white kid from America? Does that make does that make a big difference? Uh, well, I guess what I'm trying to say is when you were in northern China, the girls said what? You're so handsome. You're so white. And your eyes are blue. Why are your eyes blue? I don't know. If my, are my eyes blue or green? They... And uh, and. Uh, of all the all the young boys like you or boys or men like you uh, is cute. Uh, well, they, they a lot of times I get asked. They say you're American, and I say yes, and they say why aren't you fat? Why aren't you fat? Yes, and I I actually had a a woman recently ask me, uh, do they have black people in America? What? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is from China. Yeah, a woman in are, China. I mean, are they that? Well, this was a, a little bit of an older woman, and she asked me in Chinese, and she said that a few days before she had met a black person who said they were American, and she said, I want to ask you, are there really black people in America? And I guess she's not familiar with our president or anything. And yeah, some of them are really that ignorant. It can be a very insular well, society. Isn't, yeah, uh, they're, not, they're ignorant, not like stupid. They just, you guys are sort of don't get the internet the way we get it? Or? Well, they censor a lot of the internet. I mean, they don't censor information like that. But uh, yeah, a lot of it's blocked, censored Facebook, Twitter, basically anything that people could talk to each other and uh, organize any type of activity. 
they don't want that happening. Because of someone they're, they're could... afraid of protests. They're afraid of things getting out of hand. Like, like ten people get together, call ten, ten call ten, ten call ten, and all of a sudden you have know, about three thousand people. Someplace yeah, and but that's not to say it doesn't happen because they're they call them mass incidents, and yeah. even based on government statistics, a lot of those happen each year, but they're not in the news in China, and foreign journalists usually can't cover them. Um, but yeah, I, the interesting thing about this censorship in China is I think it was a Harvard study found that they don't usually censor direct criticism of the government. Like, this guy is so bad. That might not get cut out. That might be okay. But if it's like, let's all get together on Friday and show them what's up, like that kind of organization, they don't let that happen. But it does happen. Uh, yeah, but it's very grassroots and localized, and uh, the news doesn't travel very far. A lot further now that they have the internet, but yeah. Okay, we, they don't get a lot of what we do, uh, well, supposedly, or, Amer or the internet's quite open, but are we getting everything that's happening in China? Well, Is there things happening in China that you, you're not sure that we get? Uh, I think there's a lot of things happening in China that... Uh, that I obviously wouldn't know about them. Uh, I think America might have a very skewed perspective of what's happening in China, what, what kind of lives uh, Chinese people live. Well, you've been over there, and you, you, you were born here and lived here. Give me an, uh, an example. Can you tell me in what way, specifically? Well, uh, uh, food, eating, social, well, they music. Well, they, they eat Chinese food. <laughs> I guess, all right. That was a stupid question. All right. <laughs> I don't, I, they eat, good. The Chinese people eat Chinese food. That's just good to know. <laughs> if I can express my honest opinion, their, their music is uh, Chinese mainland music. Yeah. In my honest opinion, is terrible. It's all love songs. Really? Yeah. And I think it's an issue of government censorship and government control. That the safest subjects they can sing about is I love you, why'd you leave me, or we're so happy together. There's nothing really controversial or interesting about their songs. And I thought, I thought as I learned more Chinese, I'd find something I was really interested in. And no, it's just boring, boring stuff. In other words, they would, they would shoot uh, uh, Dylan if he went over there and protest songs. Shoot Dylan, shoot Dylan. I don't think they would shoot Dylan. I mean, I think if he was singing protest songs and became popular, he'd go to jail for 15 years or something like that. Um, but the interesting thing is, uh, see, it might sound like I'm talking bad about Chinese culture or creativity, but Hong Kong, which is part of, under the Chinese government's control now, yes. and Taiwan, the region of Taiwan, or yes. however you want to define it, does release some good music and some good movies. But Taiwan has, I think, 26 million people, which makes it the same size as Shanghai. So how many great singers can they really have? How many movies can they make? And Hong Kong is only 7 million people. Uh, so, I mean, it, there's a limit to how much they can be producing. Well, uh, do you see American films, I take it? Yeah, them? well, they get released in Chinese theaters. There's a limit on how many they can release, though. But um, American films almost always outsell Chinese films in China. And, of course, the Internet is, uh, you can get anything you want off the Internet, I take it. Oh, it's not. There's ways to get around. There's always a way to get around something. But for the average person, they don't have a motivation to get to Facebook. None of their friends use Facebook because Facebook's blocked. Okay. They have YouTube copies, which have uh, censored videos or videos that have been approved. And for most people, that's enough. They don't know any different, though. Well, they know that YouTube exists. They know that Facebook exists. They don't. Most of them don't have a motivation to pay extra money to pay for a program to go around the censorship. Okay, you were here uh, the, the time before, and, and then, then you had a Chinese girlfriend. When she was here, she enjoyed herself, I take it? Yeah. yeah. When she go back, what were the things that she said that were, surprised her in uh, America? I don't know. I mean, she thought that she could... She visited during Christmas time, and she thought she'd be able to walk around and explore the city, but I, she didn't understand that you needed a car pretty much to go anywhere. Uh, in the city I live in, you don't really need a car. A lot of people have cars, but you really don't need one. There's taxis and a good metro system and a good bus system.
We'll talk about that in a minute because it's interesting how this your city that that you live in came about. It's that's fascinating, but we did talk about things like uh, if you are in an automobile accident and you hit somebody, what do they do? What is well, the, well, okay, this is this has happened. I'm not saying this is a common occurrence, but it is cheaper to kill somebody and pay the family. Uh, and I don't know what the jail punishment would be. It may be, because uh, if you pay the family and the family officially forgives you, then the punishment will be lighter. So it's, drivers have been known to hit somebody and then go back and finish, kill them. Hit them on purpose. Because it's cheaper. Because, because they, yeah, they'll have less of a punishment. They won't be paying somebody's medical bills for their whole lives. This has happened a, a few times documented, and I, you can read stories on the internet of foreigners witnessing it. So, I mean, I can't give a number. Nobody can give a number for how often it happens. But, yeah, that's a real thing. And what about people jumping off roofs? Well, are you talking about Foxconn? I don't know. Well, I think you, They put nets up? Yeah, yeah, Foxconn, where they're manufacturing the iPhones. The uh, workers discovered their family would get a lot of money if they killed themselves. So these disillusioned workers who hated their jobs, uh, where they were manufacturing the iPhone, not directly related to, related to the iPhone. Yeah. Uh, they were climbing up and jumping and killing themselves, but I've and getting an insurance policy. Yeah, and their family would get money. But mm -hmm. I, I've read that like the suicide rate wasn't actually si significantly higher than uh, the average suicide rate. So it was kind of a media thing that they were doing. Made good news. Made but a good story. But they were putting nets up. Yeah, they put nets up so the people couldn't jump off the buildings and they land in the nets. So it ended that. So, that that's kind of when. When I hear something like that, I mean, uh, I well, find I mean, that odd. People hate their jobs and kill themselves anywhere in the world, I think. Is suicide a big deal over there? I mean, I don't have... Uh, Not I mean, the statistics, but... I don't have the statistics, but I read an article recently that said suicide has dropped significantly. I think it was in The Economist. The suicide has dropped significantly. In China? Yeah, recently. Because of... Better opportunities, I think. I think uh, China, for a while was the only country in the world that more women than men killed themselves. And now that's not true You're anymore. You're kidding me. I, I wish I had chance. I wish I had known these questions beforehand. I could have prepared some information. Well, I didn't know what I was going to ask you, so. But uh, yeah. But you know, I can, I can understand. Well, how do men treat women? Well, OK, it's different for everybody. But there's definitely sort of a 1950s sort of attitude. Like a man is a man, a woman is a woman. A woman should be cleaning and cooking. The man should be working. But the women also now often work. So it's that, that being, I'm the boss. Yeah, and a lot of Chinese women don't like it very much. And a lot of Chinese women are found, finding themselves empowered because they can get jobs, uh, get money. And they have money and they can leave now where they couldn't yeah, before. Yeah, and divorce is going up. In fact, uh, June, in the district of the city I live in, they had, I think, over 600 divorces in June, which is a record for the district. Really? Yeah. Um, so divorce, at least in the southern part of the country, is uh, going up. Yeah, more and more common. And it's relatively easy. To get a divorce. Yeah. Uh, the newspaper I worked for ran a great article uh, with a, this quote from a guy, and it was like, uh, they have to hire extra staff members and open more uh, windows at like the city hall area to process the divorce requests. And it's so e easy. I take it, what, 30, 60 days to get a divorce? Or? I don't know the process, but I know it's easier than in America if both sides agree to it. It's, I think it's stamping a piece of paper almost. And that's it? I think, yeah, I'm, don't quote me on it. I mean, I'm not on TV or anything. No, of course not. We, 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 <laughs> Wouldn't want to give out any false one, information. No, no, this, if it's put on YouTube, you know, no one watches it anyway. So, yeah, probably uh, not. So. Uh, now, the city that you live in is close to, what, Hong Kong? Yeah, I live in Shenzhen. It borders Hong Kong? Yeah, it borders Hong Kong. I can take the Shenzhen metro directly to the Hong Kong border. And, and then I have to go through, essentially, it's customs. Hong Kong customs. is customs. Essentially, yeah. And it's interesting. Uh, OK, you know, I'm sure you know the history of Hong Kong. Yes, it was uh, leased for 100 years. Yeah. And it was British. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, leased by force. On, yes, yeah. yes. In 1997, it came back, and it's still administered uh, relatively separately, still now. Still now. S still now. Still. Yeah. Okay. So they actually have like a custom system that you have to pass through. And it's actually easier for me as an American to pass from mainland China to Hong Kong than it is for a Chinese person to pass from mainland China to Hong Kong. Reason? Um, well, they know that I'm American. My country's relatively affluent. A lot of mainland Chinese don't have that. They could just go to Hong Kong and uh, try to live on the street. Uh, do they, they do that? I don't know. I don't think it happens very often. I mean, there's... Uh, I mean, to be frank, a lot of uh, women from mainland China will go to Hong Kong for prostitution and stuff like that. Um, but the Hong Kong authorities are pretty strict about who can get in. And actually, how easy it is for you to get into Hong Kong actually depends on what city in mainland China you're registered in. So for instance, if you're a Shanghai resident, they can assume that you're relatively OK. Uh, and then getting into Meaning the, OK, meaning you've got Financially money. OK, yeah. Okay, financially. And it will be easier for you to get the permit to cross into Hong Kong. But if you're a resident of some rural uh, village almost, and it would maybe they'd let you in once a year, and it'll be like a one-year pass. Really? A, a pass that can work once a year. Sure. Yeah, so. Now, the city that you live in, that you were telling me the other night, was quite fascinating how it came about. Yeah, it was the first uh, part of the of China to try the um, they call it reform and opening. So economic, basically capitalism. The first part of China to try some capitalism, and uh, since communism took over, and there were there were a fence around it, gates around it. Why? Mm. Okay, so the, they built Shenzhen, and then they built uh, checkpoints, and I guess walls. I'm not sure how big the walls were. But my coworker was telling me that when he was a child, to go into Shenzhen, you had to pass through a checkpoint and be searched. And to leave Shenzhen, you had to be searched also. And this was when Shenzhen was experimenting with capitalism, and the rest of China was, I guess, on paper, still communist. Um, and I guess the checkpoints were to keep the capitalism in. <laughs> Instead of keep, keeping the capitalism in. Yeah, to keep the capitalism in or to limit the exposure of the I don't, evil capitalists getting into the rest of the country. Uh, it didn't work. And it actually, certainly changed. The news now, like the news within the last month, is that they're taking down all the checkpoints. So it's kind of they're getting rid of that, that part of their history. Wait, that's bizarre. That's really bizarre. Yeah, it was bizarre for us to think about it now. But I mean, when they were trying it, they didn't know how things were going to go. Well, they had, had Hong Kong. I mean, they could figure out how... There must be a lot of things. If it's that difficult to get into it, then getting into China... Well, Chinese leadership had been isolated from the rest of the world for so long, and it took Deng Xiaoping to really show initiative. And even he was opposed, like what he did in Shenzhen. Like he probably... He, 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 had to say, he had to pick this area, a fishing village. And he said, okay, this, this fishing village area, a relatively big fishing village, this, they'll try capitalism here. And he got enough people to agree to let him do it. To try it. To yeah, experiment. to try it. So that's why they, it was fenced in. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, that's the reasoning and what I've read, so yeah. OK, how many people live in your city? I think 15 million, maybe. 15 million. And I think so. That took, what, just 25 years to so create? So our friends watching on YouTube could open up a tab to Wikipedia and check the population of Shenzhen and see if I'm right, 15 million, 60 million, 17 million maybe? That's big. Population-wise, but it's not. And what's the area, though? How, square miles, or you I don't know? I have no idea. Yeah. But that's certainly larger than New York. I mean, yeah, it's larger than New York. It's much larger than New York. Um, you were telling me uh, it, at one time that was the most, one city was the most populous one part of the no, no, one part of the city, the Lohu district, was named the uh, most densely populated uh, area in the world by some study. Uh, and and I, what was I, it like? Explain with Lohu. What was Lohu like? Yeah. Well, Lohu was the part closest to Hong Kong, like yeah. the first part to open up. Okay. And you've seen Blade Runner, right? 
Yes. If you go there, it's like Blade Runner. It's there's trash all over the street. Like people, like you have to walk down the sidewalk, practically touching shoulders with people. The buildings are built on top of buildings, and then there's like these small little alleyways of like just damp water. The dripping water. The dripping water, basically. And then when it's dark, it's a Chinese thing that they love these neon lights. So neon lights everywhere. So just think Blade Runner, and uh, yeah, that's that's what Lohu can be like. You know, I, when I saw that Blade Runner, I mean, that was with Her the one with Harrison Ford, correct? Yeah, that'd be it. Yeah. Uh, when I saw that, I thought, wow, that's, is this of the future or is that the... But I guess it, there was a place... That must be where they've got the idea to do that. To Maybe do they shot it there. N no, yeah. this... What, what year was Blade, did that movie come out? 80s? I think so. How much? Sure. No, they would never... They, well, they didn't shoot it there because the city probably barely existed at that point. I mean, I think it founded in 1981. And it's 17, 16 million people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And all high-rise, I take A it. lot of high-rises. They also have urban villages, which are like kind of the holdover villages. Within? Within the city, yeah. So they have like these fancy high-rise buildings that are yeah. developed and expensive yeah. rent. And then they have these other places that were built maybe 10 years ago, 15 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago. And they're smaller buildings. And those are called urban villages. And they're slowly getting knocked over like piece by piece for more high-rises. But those parts of the city are actually the most interesting. There's narrow, narrow alleyways and like hole-in-the-wall noodle shops. And uh, I don't know, just like businesses operating without licenses, and this. Uh, I mean, that, that would that would definitely be something. That if if I went there, I'd like to see that type of area. That yeah. might have been very. Fa it must be fascinating. Yeah, it is really fascinating. It's really, and it's, it's unfortunate that they're destroying most of them. But my Chinese coworker did point out that the people living there tend to have a lower quality of life, which is true. They have problems with electricity. Uh, their sewage oh. doesn't get filtered. Yeah, okay. So it goes into pipes, but it, it they were built before they had like a sewer sure. uh, filtration plant to sure. run it to. Yeah. So it's all outdated stuff, but it's the part of the city that has the most soul, really. That would be I think some well, I'm sure a lot of people are doing it, you know, going through there with cameras and you know. There's an it. interesting blog called mm -hmm. uh, Shenzhen Noted. You can search that online. Spell Shenzhen. Uh, S H E N Z H E N Shenzhen. Okay, the Z. Yeah, Z H E N. So, if anybody out there would like to go to it, that's all they have to do. If they want to look it up, yeah. And there's a blog called Shenzhen Noted, written by a Chinese woman. I've never met her, but she basically documents the uh, construction that's taking place around the city, and uh, it's really interesting stuff. And it's written in English, also. So. Now let's get let's get you. Were, we're teaching English, and uh, <clears throat> this is a, a fascinating story because I think this could probably only happen in China. You're teaching English at a school, and your boss is crazy. Oh, my last one. Yes. Yeah, he was a bit of a psychopath. <laughs> okay. And uh, well, okay. So he's a rich guy who's been given a lot of money, and he has a lot of money, and he's never worked a day in his life. And uh, his family has money, and his, I think most of his family are successful business people. They own buildings in different cities, his family does. Oh, yeah. And I think they gave him a English training center as like a little toy he could play with. And, and which, which I guess that's o toy. okay, but when you like invite foreigners to live there and their lives are dependent on that business being run well, yeah. Their work lives, like finding a place to stay is all dependent on this guy having his act together and he never had his act together. He barely came into the office, was always being dishonest with us. Um, money wise, etc. Yeah, money wise. Like, oh, why why is there some money missing from my paycheck? Oh, meet me next week to talk about it. You go to the meeting time, oh he forgot to come. Oh he's too busy. Oh he hasn't been in the office. And Meet next week, next week, next week. Then it's been already a month. You've already spent more time chasing a few hundred yuan RMB. It wasn't even worth your time what's to your, do it. Which yuan? Uh, yuan is, is the Chinese currency, also called RMB. It, what, it, one is worth what? Uh, it's it about s more than six for one US dollar. 
Okay, so six would be a dollar. About, yeah, more than six is a dollar. Okay. So that took place and you decided to leave there. Well, or did they... I, well, I put up with that for more than a year because I always figured, okay, he had an excellent, like it was designed really well, excellent place for a school. He didn't know what he was doing. I figured eventually he would bring in some management that did and things would really start get go, get going and I could move up in some sort of hierarchy. Yeah. And then they would expand because he had all the resources to do it and he had people who knew how to do it. He just never let them do it. I mean, we had arguments and arguments about buying books. Like, do the children need to have books to study in class? And we're like, we need books, we want these books. No, those are too expensive. Then he buys a giant screen TV to advertise his school or buys uh, <laughs> pictures for the side, on the size of buses around the city pictures to advertise the school, but we don't have books. We want paper to print something. They won't open the closet for us because they're saving money on paper. But, you know, big screen TV, advertisement, that's okay. And, well, that... So okay. I put up with it for a while. I figured yeah. it would straighten out. Yeah. It never did. Yeah. And then finally, um, some money went missing from my paycheck again. And I think they probably expected me to argue or squabble over it and I just decided not to work there anymore. And you left? I left, yeah. And then the trouble began? Uh, well, I had to change my visa and I got uh, legal threats from this gentleman and um, sort of bizarre threatening emails. I mean, I called a lawyer to make sure I was okay. <clears throat> Um, and actually, the contract didn't matter anymore after he hadn't followed it by paying me my full wages. So I was okay. But uh, you never know in China. You never know what kind of influence somebody has somewhere and what they could do or what they can't do. Or what they could do to you. Get rid of you, have you arrested for something. <laughs> Can they do stuff like that? <laughs> They're not going to bump me off well. over leaving a training center. I don't think they would have me arrested, but I mean, they could make it difficult or impossible for me to get a visa if he knew the right places, right people in the right places or paid them enough money. Yeah, that could happen. Now, you you left there, but let's see if I, I, I try to unscramble that because I, this is an important point. You left there and you were still with on his visa? No, I switched to a, I switched to a business visa. So to be frank, the visa system in China is a wreck. Uh, it's very difficult for people to be on the proper visa. Um, I work at a newspaper now, and a source, which I will not name, but is speaking in good authority, estimated that 80% of the teachers in the city were working on the wrong visa. That means 80% of the teachers, foreign teachers, in the city would be subject to arrest and de deportation if the police felt that that was what they should do. Okay, so, so in fact, let, all right, let's so, move So what I, I yeah. left, and I went on a business visa, which is actually the, what the majority of the teachers are on. And then when I got a new job, I wanted to go on the proper visa for them. But I was still technically tied in the system to my old boss, so yes. I couldn't go on the proper work visa for yes. them. So I had to talk to him and send him emails and call him and show up at like the training centers and wait there for uh, hours and hours. And uh, Why don't you just have them beat up? <laughs> <laughs> Not sure that's much of a solution. Well, you know, the uh, America, you know, the uh, no, Godfather. Not, I, I America scale. has much more law and order than China Oh, has. yes, so. yes, by all means. It's, it certainly sounds like it. Well, now, why I sort of been holding on to this a little because how did you get now you're working for a newspaper mm -hmm. it's owned by the state I take it um, I don't know if it's legally owned by the state but I think it receives money from the district and all the me district meaning the district of the city that we're in okay so everything is divided in a district and whatever district you're from is you know. yeah um, Futian district I think, I'm not sure, okay. I think it receives money from them or support okay. as a sort of a service to the foreign residents there, plus all media is uh, 
technically at the service of the Chinese government. And th that's just the official law that all media is at the service of the Chinese at the service of the Communist Party. So you really can't say. So anyway, you how did you get the job? You're writing now or you're editing? You're doing both actually. Yeah, I'm. Most of my work is editing, but if I write a story on my own time, they'll publish it. And uh, and you wrote one so. I've written a few, you yeah. got the job, and the person who worked in your job for a while, he worked, worked a year or so, a couple of years, is now working for? Before me, there was a, an Indian gentleman who had my job, and he currently works for Reuters in Singapore. Uh, yeah. yeah, and did he get you the job? or? Uh, actually, I, I met him when he was in Shenzhen. Just, uh, I met him, and uh, we talked for a while. And uh, I was like, yeah, I'm, I was trained as a journalist, but I'm teaching English. I mean, I'm not so happy doing it. And he's like, well, I know a job that uh, I had a job before at this small little English newspaper. I can see if they need a new editor. And uh, he recommended me for the position. And I actually found out later that I knew the person who had the position that I was interested in. And I talked to him, and he said he was leaving. So I was recommended by two, two different people. two people for the same the one position. who's leaving and the one who's left. Yeah, and then um, did the interview, did some editing, and uh, so that's how I got the job. I mean, in the whole city, I'm not sure how many people have a journalism degree plus some experience writing and editing for a newspaper, uh, doing an internship. So well, this is just uh, th this is a, quite incredible because. You know, your mother and I obviously have realized that you're far more happier now than you, than you were. You're, you're like doing what you really want to do. And uh, that has made, I think that we believe that this certainly made a difference in your life. But you, since you've been home, which has been going on a week, you have been working. What have you been doing writing-wise? Oh, I, I also freelance for a magazine, mostly food reviews. But... I don't know much about food, okay? Yeah, I know. <laughs> so perhaps I'm not the most qualified person to do food reviews, but I do my research, and I do a lot of research, and I make sure I get it right, and I talk to my friends who do know a lot about food and alcohol, and these 300-word food reviews, which they're good, they're as good as I can make them, and I think yeah, they're good quality. Yeah, yeah. It just takes me a long time. So basically, I've been leaving my parents to work in a coffee shop on my uh, food review. I'm on draft 11 right now. Draft 11? <laughs> draft 11, yeah. No, it has to be done by the 15th. I, yeah, I have until the 15th. And I, s I send it to my editor. Uh, the, this is not the newspaper. This is for magazine. magazine yeah, freelancing. Okay. This magazine. I send it to her, and she like gives me some advice, sends it back. Tears and I, and pot, I, I take it. And she gives it. me some general advice, and I rewrite it and try again. And... So far, they've all turned out well, and I'm sure as I do more, I'll get faster at it. But I've written five or so so far. What uh, now? The food obviously is different. 